So, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the first live panel for the VQA and the dialogue workshop. Um, if you don't know me, I am Ashwarya, research scientist at DeepMind, and I'll be moderating this panel today. So, before we proceed, there are a few quick notes. Um, first of all, we are going to and we are recording this session um, so that those who couldn't join us due to time zone differences and such can watch it later. Um, and uh, we'll be posting the recorded panel on the external website. Um, secondly, please keep yourself muted, everyone except the panelists. Uh, and panelists, feel free to interrupt or speak um, at any point. It would also be nice if people can keep their video on. It just feels nicer. Uh, of course, if you are comfortable. Um, and we encourage all the audience members to ask questions. This is your opportunity to interact with the speakers. So please ask questions. Um, and in order to do so, please either type the question or type that you have a question on the chat box. Um, and then I will go through the chat box sequentially, call out the name of the person who typed the question. And then you have to unmute yourself, ask the question, and then you can mute yourself when you are done asking the question. Sounds good? Um, right, so we have six panelists in this session. Uh, many of them are also invited speakers at the workshop. Um, so if you don't know them already, or if you haven't watched their talk already, please watch their talks. Uh, you can know a lot more about their work. Um, we also have Naseem Parveen on the panel, who we are very excited to have. Um, because she has a unique background um, and perspective on technology uh, relative to most other researchers we meet at CVPR. So before we get started, Naseem, would you like to uh, introduce yourself and say a few sentences about your work? Oh, sure. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm Naseem Parvin. Uh, thank you both. Uh, Davy and Abhishek for your invitation. I'm excited to be here. Uh, my background, uh, well, it's mixed. I, have, I come from electrical engineering, so in a lot of ways I'm like you <laughs> all, uh, but I took a sharp turn. I'm in the humanities now. I did a PhD in design and I do design philosophy and design ethics as my research. Um, sounds good. We are very excited to have you, Naseem. Um, and we are also excited to have on the panel uh, Dana Gurari, who in her talk talked about VQA for the real world applications, Felix Hill, who talked about embodied language learning, Mateusz Malinowski, who talked about VQA and related topics, Gia Sen Lu, who talked about multitask uh, vision and language representation learning, and Timos Karatsas, who talked about modeling the interplay between textual and visual information, particularly for text based VQA. All right, so let's get started. Um, I don't see any question on the chat box yet. So I'll start with a question. Um, and please mention that you have a question on the chat box, right? This is for you to ask questions to the panelists. Um, so let me start with my first question. Um, so this question is inspired by uh, Dana's talk, uh, but this is for uh, all the panelists. Feel free to jump in. So. In her talk, Dana uh, uh, mentioned that uh, they found that training, uh, so we are testing on VizWiz, which is a real world VQ data set, right? Um, so if you, there are two ways to train your models when you want to test on that data set. Either you train purely on in-domain data, which is the VizWiz data, but VizWiz is not sufficient, like it's not that uh, huge in, in terms of the number of data points, so it is a relatively smaller data set or you can pre-train on a different data set, let, let's say VQA, which is not designed for a particular application, and then fine tune on VizWiz. And what they found was um, that completely training on in-domain data, like completely training on VizWiz alone, is slightly worse than training on um, out of domain, like VQA and then uh, fine tuning on VizWiz. So this led me to thinking that uh, if we are thinking about designing application specific uh, uh, models, so let's say we want to design a model for a particular application, um, is um, one way to make practical VQ models is to design a model for a desired application, right? But this requires rethinking the model design for every, every application. So does it make sense that we build one model train on non-application specific, but large data sets? Uh, in this case, the example was VQA. 
and fine tune for each desired application instead of uh, rethinking the model design for each given application. I guess I'll kick it off. <laughs> um, and I would be excited to hear what other panelists have to say. I don't think one, one uh, approach per data set is a good approach going forward. Um, so while the VisWiz data set represents one use case, so that's people who are blind, um, we also have seen many other data sets that have bubbled up, including for the medical domain, we could imagine in factory inspection, we could imagine doing VQA for health, um, not just for doctors, but also just for a generic person who's sitting around trying to get information for fun with kids. Um, and so I don't think us trying to start to segment off every application is a way to go. Um, one of the key challenges I think we're gonna have to deal with and trying to figure out a one size fits all model is really figuring out how to handle the long tail of answers to visual questions. And so to me, that's a promising direction. And I guess I'll stop there because I'd love to hear other panelists and what they have to say as well. Anyone want to add anything? Yeah, so I think that uh, working on, on, on the scale and training on a lot of different tasks and different data sets, I think that this is uh, a very interesting uh, research direction that is uh, also very promising. And we see this uh, not only in uh, vision and language, but also in, in NLP domain, like for instance, uh, GPT is uh, such uh, one uh, model. And there's hope, there's uh, a possibility that uh, by training those models on a lot of different tasks and different uh, data sets, the model can actually learn some kind of background information. And maybe this uh, tail distribution will be a lesser problem because often the state distribution is uh, due to one, uh, one data set. And uh, once we cover a lot of different data sets, then, uh, then, then this tail is, is, is becoming bigger. Uh, of course, it still will be. Uh, it still exists. Uh, I guess the the there are of course uh, limits for that. Uh, but I think that this is uh, one of the most promising directions uh, right now to, to to train a representation on uh, on a lot of different tasks, different data sets, and then perhaps uh, fine tune for uh, some specific downstream uh, tasks. Anything else anyone wants to add? Or should we take the next question? Well, I would just add that, my, yeah, my answer is absolutely yes. It feels to me like the most obvious yes to any question I think I've ever heard on a panel. And I'd be really interested to know if anyone thinks the, like the answer should be no, because maybe that's where the more interesting discussion is in a way. Okay, I'll jump on that. <laughs> so just to give the no side, just to just okay, for a conversation. Okay. Um, I think the value of trying to segment off the community into looking at different applications as we start to sliver off what are the hard, interesting problems. I think different domains bring forth different challenges. And while it's nice that, you know, VQA is huge, right? Like you can is any question about any image, and that's like that's crazy. That's such a huge problem. And so I think the idea of slivering off and having each community kind of focus on, okay, this is the problem in this application, this is this, allows us to start to break apart and tease apart what makes it challenging. So then later we can come together and holistically figure out how to put those pieces together. So there we have it. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks, you're right. I, um, it, it wasn't 100% guessing, but yeah, <laughs> you're right. I, that totally makes sense to me. Right, so uh, just to chip in on that. Uh, I also agree. I mean, I, I think that we should eventually be looking to a single model that is able to do a, a number of different tasks. Now, the question for me is not, is not that, is how do we go for that? So both, both Felix, for example, and Jason in their talks, they spoke about, about that in different, in different ways. You know? uh, and uh, I, will, I will agree with, with, with everybody that this is the, the desired final goal, but directly trying to... Uh, to put everything in the same box, just merging all the data sets on one side and trying to respond to a number of different things on the other side. Well, Jason says that this works reasonably good, but I think that if you think about how, how humans do that, 
you have a different effect there. So before humans try to respond to questions, they already know how to respond to questions. They already know a lot of things about the world and about how the world works, etc. So I think that we have to be a bit more constructive about how, how do we go for that instead of just thinking that an end-to-end -end statistical model will just capture all the possible ways different modalities uh, are supposed to, uh, to work together. So that's not, that's, not, that's not a no, it's a yes, but, no? So just to take that discussion a little forward, <clears throat> and then the question is, how do we envision we combine all the systems, right? Do we have these model pieces that are specialists in this, like in their own domain, like for instance, text VQA, or, and then uh, models that are good at re uh, relational reasoning and stuff, and then you have a hierarchy of the decisions that you take, okay, then you pick the expert and then ask the expert what the answer could be. Is that where we should be headed? Or is is that then now we take these experts and try to combine them in a way that we have just one unit and not necessarily for a modular piece? What, what are the thoughts? What are the inclinations currently? Yeah, I, I think this is a really great question. Uh, for me, I, I feel like uh, we, before we move into this modular part, like a different, different head. So if you see that uh, there's a lot of pay, a lot of like work uh, from past few uh, from like past few months that uh, people using like transformer based models to modeling vision language or pure language base, and uh, so people use like uh, just a, a specific head to to kind of for different tasks, and uh, yeah. So one thing. Uh, uh, but I think a missing part, which means one thing is the memory. So basically that uh, human, like um, even like in biology, that it's like they inherent a lot of like uh, memory kind of uh, sense of the world. And the second thing is that uh, something like modular network, whether uh, like something is okay. Uh, one thing why my modular network probably not working uh, well earlier is that the representation is not good enough. So now we have a better representations. Can we have better, can we have some working mechanism like on modular for different heads that's making better performance. And even like we don't need to fine tuning to the network at all. Like uh, we see that's so now the like GPT-3 that's the works that if you have a good enough, uh, like train on with enough large data set and your representations even don't need to fine tuning on some tasks you perform this. So, so I think the advice that's is good enough. Uh, I think the, the obvious direction is to thinking about how can we using this, uh, is this kind of representations to go further, something like modular network, something like a specific head, or how can like those things can emerge for different tasks. All right, thanks. So I think like one really interesting thing that comes out of the question you just posed is um, how can we optimally, kind of, if, if, if we're not suggesting that any specific task should be the training regime for the, for, or at least the initial training regime for, for these models, how can we specify or determine what the optimal way to do a sort of generic task independent training is? And I'm not sure about the right answer, but my intuition always takes me in, into um, the sort of naturalistic curricula from which humans learn. And I always think that's a nice place to look for ideas about how to build up the layers of experience that might optimally lead to the best representations in one of these models. So a nice example from recent work that I think I've read, and experts in this group would be able to correct me if I'm characterizing it incorrectly, but I think that it's now been determined quite clearly that if you pre-train on more of a sort of VQA task, and that that can often be more effective than a pre-training regime that just involves training on image nets. Um, and I think that, you know, intuitively it feels to me like, well, a lot of the generic sort of quite general VQA tasks um, actually characterize the distribution of experience and maybe a distribution of all the things that you might want to know about in the world with some greater realism than image nets. So one thing is, for example, that the, just by virtue of having any sort of sentences involved in the data set, you get a very skewed distribution of the work experience of works. Whereas in ImageNet, there's quite, there's quite an artificially uniform distribution over categories. It's not totally uniform, but it's quite uniform. And of course, the identity of those categories is pretty ad hoc with ImageNet. Um, where it, so it might be that this VQA sort of pre-training process 
Uh, that's not the only thing that makes it different. But one way it's different is that it's somehow sort of a more natural holistic um, spanning of the sorts of things that you want a model to have experience of. Um, and that we might be able to think further in that direction uh, in terms of how to get all of that sort of general early style knowledge into the models such that they can then sort of layer that, abstract that knowledge and layer it together in order to be like optimally pre-trainable for, for other downstream tasks. Anyway, that's just a thought. <laughs> uh, I, I fully agree with, with this view. I think that a naturalistic setup is probably the best way to go for it. And that's what probably Justin was saying before. Uh, having a world model before you start is probably quite important before you can do anything in the real world. Then there is loads of things that happen on top of that. Like, for example, three out of the five challenges in, in this workshop this year are about text. And that's something that is a learned ability. And that's also something to look into. How, how do people learn language? You know, when, when, when small children learn, learn language, they learn the visual representations of objects and the linguistic structure we use to describe them at the same time. The, their parents point at a cat and say, oh, this is a cat. You know? So uh, there is multimodality at the basis of that as well. And uh, doing all this in a, in a real embodied way, I think it's, uh, it's the way forward. So all data sets together, yes, absolutely. But uh, I think that we need much more before we start playing with data sets, which are quite simplistic, actually, because they're just images and, and text at this point. You know? And I think the real world is much more complex than just pairs of images and text. Anything else to add to this discussion or should we change the course of the discussion? Does anyone have a question from the audience or the organizers? Olson, I am not sure if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Please go ahead. Lauren, sorry. sorry. Hi, so I was just wondering, kind of related to the domain issue where you have things like technical jargon or very specific images, how you would see where things might be used in a way different from their context in a broader question answering base, how you would see incorporating that into modeling. Sorry, can you repeat the question one more time, the first half of the question at least? So where you have like technical jargon or terms that are used in a very specific manner inside of a field that might not be used in that manner, say if you just look the term up in the standard English dictionary or something like that, how do you see a model learning when to use that specific context to answer, as part of answering a question? Yeah, so I think that, um, you know, we're hearing a little bit of it about this from other panel speakers about starting to understand the worldview and the context. And for me, I think a big part of the future of EQA is really starting to draw context in. And for me, that inspiration comes from when you look at the answer distributions from that we have in our data sets. So a number of the data sets in our current challenge have, you know, 10 crowdsourced answers. And often there's not one single unified response. Often there are many different responses. And I think we can even see when it's not technical jargon, um, there's still a distribution of how people perceive what is the question and how to respond to it. And so I, I believe that there's gotta be a way to get more external knowledge embedded in our VQA models so we can really start to have these systems that don't assume every question has one fixed answer, but rather every question can be interpreted in multiple ways. And a large part of the VQA system is to figure out which path to go to come up with the most probable answer. And we've seen a little bit of this trajectory with um, output layers of models having, um, you know, allowing for probabilities to be output rather than just saying, here's the one answer and this is the way it goes. Um, but I definitely think we need to come up with more sophisticated models in that range. So uh, I think there are two ways to go for that. So um, one way is to directly think about an expert VQA model, which is expert in a very specific domain, you no? Know? So technical drawing or something, you no? Know? Um, that's probably the easy way 
you, you collect a huge data set of technical drawings, you kind of embed the facts about how technical drawings has to have to be interpreted there, and you kind of train it to do that. The problem, of course, is that this, this VK model will not be able to answer anything else apart from training, the, training whatever. No? So it's, uh, it's, it's probably the way we're doing things right now. We are kind of segregating data sets and trying to attack these kind of smaller problems. A different way to go for that would be to start with a generic, to start with a small child that knows a lot about the world and understands how the world works, and then try to train it to one or more specific domains. And that's a long learning learning process so that is not easy to do and it doesn't require a single a single data set you know? uh, and of course if you just directly go for the low hanging fruits and getting state of the art results out you'd better go with the, with the, with the first easy approach than this this the second one you no know? but uh, uh, my feeling is that we should be looking into this uh, the second constructive way of doing things instead of directly looking into specific experts If we have no further points to add to this discussion, I would like to take the next question from Devi. Yeah, so this will, I think, change topics a little bit, but Nassim, I'm curious to hear from you. Um, so I know you've uh, worked quite a bit on uh, fashion and mobility, and those, um, it's not very directly relevant to vision and language specifically, but it's very relevant to computer vision in general with autonomous driving and um, parsing images to understand fashion and making recommendations for fashion and things of that sort. And I don't know if you had a chance to check out some of the talks from the workshop yesterday, but in general, I'm curious to hear how you think about these problems and how you approach them and what your perspectives are. Um, sure, I, I'll do my best. To, in, in my mind, the analogy is sort of a lot of discussion around self-driving cars and how um, you know, they focus, uh, when, it, when it comes to ethics of self-driving cars, and that's been very dominant in the discourse, they talk about the sort of uh, moment when the car has to make the decision about who to kill, sort of the trolley problem. Um, and um, that's fine, but uh, the point that I make over and over is, well, why is the car there in the first place, right? <laughs> like, what the, like why uh, did it get to that intersection where it needs to make that difficult decision because it means that once it's there so many design um, choices have been made including the infrastructure including the policies um, that we have that have failed and now like we are at that moment of decision making so why not step back and think about what is the kind what are the kinds of mobility systems that we want to design in order to avoid that problem altogether why are we spending so much of our time and money figuring out what's the best kill decision when we can actually design better mobility systems and mobility infrastructures um, i was actually struck by donna's talk when she was talking about how the data set that people worked on before uh, didn't actually have the questions that the blind people ask. <laughs> that was really striking to me. And then even sort of, I was, it was refreshing to see that she's going to this new data set, but I actually wonder what would people with disabilities say about this approach? Is this the problem that they want to see solved? As a designer, when I see those questions, I think about all the ways that design has failed. We are designing products and environments that are not um, accessible. And so now we are at this moment trying to solve this problem with the figure of the blind, which I actually is my question to you, like where did that start? And like sort of are people aware of this whole other movement in disability studies of you know nothing for us without us and how are those people going to be involved in this process and is this the problem that they want to see solved you know um, so I do see a lot of parallels between the work I have done in those other domains and what's happening here uh, are we solving the problem that needs to be solved or you know do we need to step back and rethink what we are doing. Um, 
Yeah, I guess I'll jump in and try to respond some to that. <laughs> so first, I the way I think about VQA for our community is twofold. One is, yeah, we want to help individual segments of the population. Um, and that gets to the very first question of the panel, which is, do we do one set of models for each problem? But then the, the second one is, do we, you know, how do we solve the generic visual question answering approach so that when we solve the generic one, it would apply to each segment. And so I think that that's the fracturing that happened with the VizWiz data set that I spoke about is that we were able to break off this population of people. And when I say we break off this population and what they're thinking about, it's only in one use case. So the use case that was presented was the use case where people want answers to their questions when they take a picture. There are studies that show that people also want the kinds of information that you get um, for, about images when browsing online. So a large percentage of the images online are not accessible. They don't come with any sort of what's called alt text, which is something that delivers useful information. And there's been a huge positive response from my understanding from people who are blind about the kinds of um, captioning in this case that it's being provided for online images from platforms such as Microsoft and Facebook. And so I think no matter what VQA and solving it is going to help that population get feel more engaged. But to push it even further, I think there's a lot, you, you made the comment about, you know, building technology with them for them. And I think that that's an important trajectory and that requires a truly interdisciplinary group. So it's hard to achieve because you need people who are social scientists grouping up with computer vision experts. And that's something my team is doing, but um, it contributes to the bigger, in my thought, it contributes to the bigger energy of this community that we have of VQA. And it's one voice that feeds to the larger problem. I agree, and I think I would echo then, sort of, as I was listening to the conversation, not being an expert, uh, but uh, is it Demosthenes? I'm so sorry. Demos, to... Demos is fine. <laughs> Demos. Just Demos. Uh, uh, sort of like what he was pushing for, like, let's look at the bigger context of what the problem is. Like, let's think about these images, like, um, like what are the questions that people are asking and what are you know the kinds of problems that they are trying to solve i think doing that upfront work and actually working with these kind of, the other thing is that the like experiences of the blind are not the same that we have many different kinds of blindness and we have many different kinds of settings and uh, sort of thinking about intersectionality here like what are what are these experiences like it can help you tailor um, this question and actually maybe ask entirely different questions that still have to do with, with visual question and answer, but are uh, differently framed. But I agree with you that it's not easy to do. <laughs> yeah, there are many barriers to that. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the really cool things about the business data set is that was built by, you know, people who are blind, like they're, they're real questions. And some of the examples that I like that really help us think about how do we introduce and create new data sets that reflect these real needs um, can be seen when you just look at examples such as like a, there was one picture which shows a person with a green shirt with writing. And if you ask random people to make up questions, they'll say, oh, what's the writing on the shirt say? Or what color is the shirt? Or what does the person look like? But then if you look at the question from the blind person, the question is, is it clean or dirty? And so that may not be immediately obvious, but because we have this repository of questions, we can start to, as designers of data sets and challenges, which it's really exciting to see how many challenges are being included in this workshop, we can continue to grow and incorporate more of these kinds of questions that may not be immediately obvious. Yes. I just still push it though and say, if you do more, if you actually take it seriously, nothing without, without, for us without us, you will end up with much more interesting problems. And like, it will actually help push the field uh, because they will be able to tell you things that there's no way that for somebody who's not who doesn't share their experience. And again, their experiences are uh, plural. Um, 
I think it can push the field in very interesting ways. Yes, um, I, I feel resistant to make this plug, but I'll just say it. There is a parallel workshop going on right now where there is going to be a panel with people who are blind oh, who are yeah. going to be answering questions. And so that's this afternoon. I think it's it's on the VizWiz workshop uh, website. I'll put it in the chat box. But if anyone's interested in interacting with people who are blind, uh, I will add the link to when you can jump on and ask. I think, it's at, I think it's at 1.30. Thank you. <laughs> And that's 1.30 Pacific time, by the way. Ashwarya, you're muted, I think. Yeah, I just realized. Um, I was asking if someone wants to add something to this discussion, or should we take the next question? OK. Um, before I go to the next question, I would just like to remind everyone that uh, if your chat box is not open, please open it. Uh, and please type in your questions there. Um, uh, okay, so Vishwak, do you want to go ahead with the next question? Yeah, hi, I'm Vishwak. Uh, can you guys hear me? Awesome. So uh, a lot of the panelists brought up uh, how um, there has to be a paradigm shift towards embodied learning, uh, and they brought up the point that uh, learning a world model first and then tackling the uh, learning a world model first would be helpful. Uh, to me, it seems like so. Right now, uh, for tasks uh, which involve language and embodied learning, they're mostly instruction following tasks. You have an instruction and you have an embodied, uh, you have an, uh, you have an embodied agent uh, executing those instructions. But I think the gold standard in my, in my, uh, in my opinion is uh, agents which uh, consume uh, vision input and language input, interact in language input, get feedback in language, and then uh, continue to, and then uh, accomplish a certain goal. And the current, the current, uh, the current focus on instruction following doesn't seem to be a good proxy for that gold standard. So my question is twofold: Is would people agree that the gold standard I described is correct? And if you do agree, then how do we, uh, how do we build tasks and simulators which reflect that? Was that I, I, yeah, I didn't quite. Um, I didn't quite get exactly how you characterize the gold standard. Um, yeah, but to be honest, so I couldn't hear what's different. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> carry on. Carry on. So the gold standard. I think my point was just that your actions when you when you execute in the simulator is just left, right, center, and then you you consume a bunch of language and you execute and you find you do some goal. You do you you accomplish some goal. For me, it's, it, it would be, uh, the gold standard for me would be the agent actually interacting with another human, maybe uh, in natural language, getting feedback in natural language, and then uh, going towards the goal. So that to me, that interactive cycle, that loop is what the gold standard is to me. And the current task slash simulators don't capture that in my head. And my assertion was that the current task and the simulators are not a good proxy for that gold standard. So I think my question was that if we agree on what my uh, perception of the gold standard is, then uh, how do we, uh, and would you agree that the current setup uh, and tasks are not a good proxy to that? I hope that made more sense. So basically what you are saying is that you are aiming, uh, or you hope that we should aim something that is more interactive, right? So basically, the agents can interact with uh, with with other humans and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, so from my point of view, I like this uh, this kind of idea, and uh, I think that uh, the current setup is a solid bit artificial. That you know, we we only have just one question. For instance, in visual question answering, we have one question, and then the model cannot, for instance, ask. Uh, uh, further question to, uh, to 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 another person in order to let's say clarify this question and uh, uh, and do some kind of you know like interaction. Uh, so I think that this is uh, uh, this is something that is uh, very interesting. But uh, short answer is that it's uh, it's probably very difficult to uh, build such uh, environments uh, because then you have to also keep a human in the loop. It's also very difficult to 
make it automatic, right? Because uh, it's it's much easier to uh, to to imagine this offline setting where you have uh, uh, where you ask uh, humans to collect, you know, like uh, a lot of questions and a lot of data, and then run models for uh, some number of the epochs. Uh, well, here in this case, uh, at least in the evaluation time, but I guess also in the training time, you need uh, you, you need this person in the in, in the loop. So, uh, so this this asks a lot of questions about the design, about the environments, uh, also the this real time speed of the of the agents if they can uh, can be trained uh, real time, uh, and I think that to some extent maybe it's also a question of gamification. So if we can create some some interesting you know like setup. Where, where people would like to uh, interact with the agents uh, and they perceive this as a, as a kind of game uh, so that it's, uh, it's, it's very natural. Uh, but in general, yes, I, I, I like it. Uh, I think that right now we, we also have uh, more models and maybe those, those, those should be seen as intermediate steps uh, towards uh, something uh, perhaps more, more holistic and uh, more interactive. Because to, to some extent, it's also the question about the representation, how you learn the better representation. And uh, uh, from my point of view, the whole uh, aspect of the embodiment is also about uh, this question, if we can learn a better representation by, by adding the next dimension, uh, which is embodiment. Uh, and also at the same time, how far we can go with the uh, pixel uh, image base uh, question answering, right? Because there's a lot of information that is missing. So, so I would say that it's, it's a very interesting question, but I think that those are intermediate steps that we should uh, still uh, tackle and, uh, and also we should understand better uh, what those agents are capable of, of uh, and, uh, and this kind of stuff. Abhishek. Go ahead. Yeah, just to sort of follow up on that discussion, um, this is like uh, mostly inspired by, uh, by Felix's talk, but yeah, like others should feel free to chip in. Um, so, is there uh, is there reason to believe that like tech like language representations learned in sort of uh, learned with embodiment in some environment? Um, can provide a complementary signal to uh, representations learned purely from static corpuses, and if there is, then would it like uh, do people have insights on how uh, representations learned through embodied language tasks uh, can like can they even do better better than on like static uh, like for example visual question answering? Um, so the example I have in mind is for example um, so this probably applies to a lot of common sense intuitive physics. Uh, and those sort of uh, ideas. But the example I have in mind is of weighing scales. Like we can read about how weighing scales work in textbooks, uh, but till we actually try uh, one out physically, our understanding is not uh, totally complete. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I, I was wondering if people had thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I uh, kind of say something which relates to both questions. Um, I think when you work in, at the moment, our embodied environments are a really interesting direction of research. And I think it's important that some of us are, are working on them because we're finding a lot of stuff that's different in these learning systems. Or the same learning, it's very similar learning systems can exhibit quite different outcomes when learning in a more embodied setting or when learning in a more static setting. So I think that's super interesting. But there are big challenges. So obviously, the, you know, um, all of these embodied environments lack a lot of aspects of the real world whether it's more on the visual side or whether it's more on the control side. Um, and actually another big important one, I think, is, to, is just to do with the frequency distribution of experience. So um, uh, like uh, it strikes me that in a lot of the experiments I've been doing, you know, things just happen with quite a clear sort of uniform regularity that they wouldn't do in the real world. Um, so all of those aspects could be improved about these in environments. Um, and I think uh, that's going to be an important part of making this direction of research successful. Um, uh, I do agree with the proposal that um, having an, uh, having dialogue would improve the, like, so basically having an interaction between a human and an agent, uh, an, um, whether it's an environment or in a real robot, would be a, would be an important like improvement on what what we can currently do. 
Um, so absolutely, that that's really hard, I think, but it's it's what I know a lot of people have been thinking about, and we should we definitely um, would it'd be a great direction to go in. Um, and to Abhishek's point about whether or not you can transfer from embodied environments kind of to real world tasks, I don't know. Uh, but my impression is that the way like transfer learning is going, I, I'm, opt I'm semi-optimistic about this. So my, I, and again, I'm not a vision expert, but my, my feeling is that you could learn quite a lot about, yeah, I guess you could call it intuitive physics or for example, what an object is, how, how a rigid body behaves. So that I think you could get good, you could get good insight into from a good simulated uh, 3D environment. Uh, but of course, you know, you're not going to get um, good experience, probably, unless it's a photorealistic environment of the real visual complexity of the world. So may, an interesting question would be, can a model which is exposed to a really good physics simulated 3D world in which things look a little bit like artificially simple and a load of video, say, or a load of images uh, together, sort of develop an ability to be like reasonably competent at understanding the physics and the rigid body aspects of real of real things um yeah so i think that's a that's a really uh that's a really critical question probably the question for all of those the answer to questions like that you know they really need to kind of be yes if we're gonna uh demonstrate this this that working in simulation is really productive in the long term um but I'm optimistic about that. Uh, anyway, that's my, that's my perspective. So I guess in the short term, uh, the, the transfer will be also limited because of the evaluation. We are evaluating things uh, somehow differently on the simulation and also on, on, on VQA. Uh, but in long term, I, uh, I, I do also believe that this is uh, a, a very good uh, direction to learn a better representation. Because when you think, for instance, about the causality, uh, so, so, so I cannot really imagine that you can learn causality in uh, in pure image-based systems. But uh, something that if you have environment and then you can interact with the environment and you have some kind of uh, physics in this, uh, it can lead to, uh, to to some kind of understanding of the uh, of the causality and uh, uh, and to build a better uh, representation of the world. Like for instance, one one of such a uh, uh, thought experiment that I have is is about the proposition on right. So basically, if you have uh, something is uh, let's say a cup is on the table, and then if you have only image pure image based system, uh, then this is, then the model can only learn uh, you know like a correlation that something is maybe you know like a few pixels above of something else like like this kind of special uh, special understanding, and probably this is the limit. But once you introduce uh, physics and interaction, then the agent can, for instance, remove the table and then everything falls down. And then you have different uh, understanding of what preposition on is. Uh, and this is just, you know, like very simple uh, uh, example here. So, so I also think that uh, in the long term, we will see uh, that we can, get a, we, we can get a better representation by training those uh, agents in uh, in uh, uh, in more interactive setup. All right. Although we are out of time, but if the panelists don't mind staying for a few more minutes, uh, there I think there are two more questions on the chat. So Asad, I I am not sure I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, you are pronouncing it correctly. Uh, so. Um, Basically, I'm new to VQ, VQA, uh, but my question was that um, this workshop is more, uh, mostly focused on um, images. Um, so the data sets of images, the, basically all the um, papers that we're seeing are um, based on images. Um, I was just wondering, like, um, wouldn't um, using video data sets be uh, more helpful because um, Firstly, uh, we can have all the static questions that we have for images. We can have those in the videos, plus we can have additional um, things going on. Now, I'm sure that there are visual uh, video uh, VQA data sets and perhaps competitions as well. But I was just wondering, like, why is it uh, that um, we are still more focused on images when talking about VQA and uh, not doing more on video VQA? Thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah, so. So, uh, so first of all, there are some uh, datasets uh, uh, that consist of videos. 
And so uh, what I believe that one of the reasons uh, are behind, uh, well, one of the reasons that uh, image-based uh, visual question saying is uh, more popular is, I guess, it's very difficult to, uh, it's, it's more difficult to process, uh, to even process uh, videos, right? So for instance, if you see what uh, people are doing in the vi video, com uh, video understanding community, like for instance, in action recognition, often you have very short, uh, uh, short videos like uh, 10 seconds or something like that. While in reality, probably you would like to have an uh, uh, agent or, you know, like network that is uh, maybe watching TV and then you can interact and ask questions about uh, what's, uh, what's going on. So I think that one of the reasons that uh, those, data, those uh, tasks are not that popular is, 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 is basically it's, it's more difficult to, uh, to, to even process, uh, uh, process those, uh, those videos. Uh, so in some sense, it's basically te uh, some, some, some technical disadvantage of uh, working with the videos as opposed to images. Uh, on the other hand, I uh, also agree that uh, videos may be more interesting modality at the end because you have uh, uh, some extra temporal information as well. Uh, and uh, and we, we, we know that animals are uh, learning better representation, or at least there are some 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 evidence from the cognitive science and neuroscience that uh, that once there is emotion, uh, then uh, then animals can learn better perception. Uh, so I think that we will see slowly also this trend to move towards not only embodiment but also towards processing videos. Uh, I think that another problem is that in video domain you don't have uh, such uh, uh, single data set as we have uh, with the images uh, and this data set is image net where you train you know like on the image net uh, you, you train your network you train the uh, representation and then you transfer this representation to a lot of different data sets uh, and because of this you don't have to retrain model over and over again I think that in video community there's no such single uh, uh, good uh, data set that people are training you know on this uh, data set and then they see a lot of transfer on uh, many different uh, data sets uh, I think that this is maybe also a question to Dana that uh, uh, because uh, this with this data set uh, what I've seen is that it has uh, images that are very difficult uh, and mostly they are difficult uh, because they are of poor quality uh, and here I'm also thinking that maybe actually switching to another domain like for instance in video domain that maybe you can also uh, give a better uh, input representation for the network uh, because uh, because then the network has more information doesn't have only information about this uh, specific image that was uh, which is probably taken at uh, uh, maybe wrong angle and maybe too close maybe too far uh, but then it has uh, much more context and uh, tem temporal resolution. Yes, uh, I definitely think that video is a very promising direction for people who are blind. Um, and so if you actually dig into the current data set that's been publicly released, you'll actually observe attempts at creating video through what was an image-based application where a picture with a question was sent off. And then the person who asked the question didn't realize that the next image they would submit would not, they thought it would go to the same person. And so they say, oh, is this image better? Oh, is this image better? And so you'll see this kind of manifestation where people are treating, they want VizWiz, the application that was used to support video streams. And they do that through their own version of burst photography, if you will. Um, so I think the application is profoundly useful. Um, my team has thought about it, but we're small. So if you wanted to jump on it, I would say, please run and jump on it. It would be profoundly useful. Um, and I just want to echo uh, what Mateo said, which is, I think a lot of this falls into, well, I think there's two elements. One is the current visual data set is incredibly difficult. And I think a lot of what our effort is uh, revolving around is trying to compartmentalize what makes it hard. And so we're slowly trying to break out what are the interesting hard problems that are embedded. But then I do think the second comes to the privilege of hardware. Um, hardware to process images, let alone, is quite expensive. And it goes to the few privileged groups that have access to funds to be able to get the GPU resources needed with the memory, et cetera. Um, video multiply by, by a lot. And so I think part of it is just we need costs and accessibility of the hardware to also become more prevalent for video to really 
be a bigger, it's not specific to VQA that video is not as prominent. I think that that's a general trend in the computer vision community. Great question. Just a small comment on that. So uh, obviously video is, uh, is extremely important, I think, and it's something that we should be looking at, but uh, it's, not, it's not video. Video is, the, is, is a good proxy for what we really are interested in. And what we're really interested in, I suppose, is the temporal aspect of things. So it's, uh, it's a matter of being able to ask questions that start with when. It's a matter of, uh, of being, being able to ask questions like, what was the name of that wine that we had when we went on vacation, like in 2015? Uh, think about life loggers, for example, no? and loads of temporal information like that. Or, or think about autonomous driving and questions that will be answered in the future. Tell me when we reach a restaurant. No? So it's, it's this kind of, of language vision interaction that uh, we should be looking at. And of course, videos is a very good proxy to that. But uh, I think that the, 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 real, the real thing to pinpoint is the temporal information in, in question answering. And uh, notice that the, the models there and the, and the kind of work they have to do is quite different from what we're doing right now. So in many of the cases, this becomes more of a retrieval problem than an answering problem in the, in the sense that we're doing it right now. No? So if, if, if I'm asking you this question about what was the wine that we drank in 2015, it's a matter of figuring out which, are, which is the evidence in this huge amount of data that you have accumulated before you answer the question. And this retrieval aspect of things is something we don't have with a single image. Uh, we do have in document analysis, which is where I come from. You know, so in, in document, there is actually tomorrow a, a different workshop on, uh, on document and text in, uh, and deep learning. And one of the things there is actually answering questions that can only be answered by examining a huge collection of documents. You know, and that's also a trivial problem, with, not exactly with the temporal aspect, but it's, it's quite similar. You know? So um, I think that it will also change the way we think about the QA when we go into this huge collection of temporal information. Uh, we are quite a bit over time, but since there is just one more question in the chat, uh, Rishabh, do you want to quickly go ahead and then uh, we'll wrap up? Uh, yeah. So I want to ask about the evaluation of these models. Uh, so currently we are evaluating these models on like static data sets and we are taking output from these models and like evaluating against the ground truth. So how about if we change the evaluation of these models to simply upload these models and, and not release that test set, like neither images nor questions, just simply upload the model, feed the data when we are running the model at the test time. So would that help in driving more progress into the field or would this be a better evaluation system than we have the current one? So thoughts on this from the panelists. Um, right. I, I will answer from my own perspective. Uh, we, we've been organizing the uh, robust reading competition for the last uh, 15 years or so. That's in the in the reading systems community. And we have this same question being asked once a, once a year. You know? Why do you do this kind of uh, online versus offline evaluation of, of things? There is pros and cons. I don't think there is a right, a right answer to that. So obviously, when you do this kind of offline evaluation, you 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 assume that uh, there is a code of conduct that everybody's following, that they will not just, you know, uh, use the test set to train or something, no? And that's exactly the same code of conduct that people are using, are assuming that people have done when they publish a paper. You don't have a way to check what they have done there, no? So it's not necessarily a bad way of doing things. Now, doing online evaluation has many advantages and uh, it's not only about evaluating better, it's not about getting the people that cheated, you know, is about uh, offering new ways of getting new insights about things, being able to, to put this method on some new data that it was not trained on. It's quite, it's quite interesting on its own right. You, know? um, you can combine things, you can combine different methods and try to do an ensembles or something you know, and see, see what happens. So it's, it's a very interesting prospect and uh, I would definitely go for it. It's obviously much more difficult for people to participate in such an online evaluation scheme and that's the main the main uh, feedback we had every time we we asked for it nobody was really keen to to turn their method into a web service which is available 24 server so that people can use it to evaluate the new stuff no? so it's a it's a technical difficulty more than anything else i think it's not a matter of picking the the cheaters right uh, 
All right, looks like there are no more comments. So we should wrap up now. Um, but if you still have questions, feel free to use the chat box on the CVPR website. There's a chat box for this panel session and there's also the chat box for each individual invited talk. Um, so you can type your questions there. Um, so thank you to all the panelists um, and thank you to all the audience members for tuning in. Um, I would like to remind everyone that we have another panel at 3 p.m. today, Pacific. So make sure you don't miss that. Um, and before the second panel, we have live QA sessions um, by the challenge winners, by challenge hosts, and like uh, poster presenters. So make sure to check that out as well. Um, and lastly, if you have not yet watched the, the recorded talks, um, I would encourage you to do that. There's a lot of exciting stuff. Um, so that's all from me. See you later today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks to the organizers. Congratulations on the great workshop and thanks. It's really good.